Order. Points of order. I will come to points of order in due time, and I shall bear those honourable members in mind. Colleagues, I would like to make a personal statement to the House. At the 2017 election, I promised my wife and children that it would be my last. This is a pledge that I intend to keep. If the House votes tonight for an early general election, my tenure as Speaker and MP will end when this Parliament ends. If the House does not so vote, I have concluded that the least disruptive and most democratic course of action would be for me to stand down at the close of business on Thursday, October the 31st. least disruptive because that date will fall shortly after the votes on the Queen's speech expected on 21st and 22nd October. The week or so after that may be quite lively <laughs> and it would be best to have an experienced figure in the chair for that short period. Most democratic because it will mean that a ballot is held when all members have some knowledge of the candidates. This is far preferable to a contest at the beginning of a parliament when new MPs will not be similarly informed and may find themselves vulnerable to undue institutional influence. want anyone to be whipped senseless, would we? No. <laughs> Throughout my time as Speaker, I have sought to increase the relative authority of this legislature, for which I will make absolutely no apology to anyone, anywhere, at any time. To deploy a perhaps dangerous phrase, I have also sought to be the backbencher's backstop. I could not do so without the support of a small but superb team in Speaker's House, the wider House staff, my Buckingham constituents, and above all, my wife Sally and our three children, Oliver, Freddie and Jemima. From the 
bottom of my heart, I thank them all profusely. I could also not have served without the repeated support of this House yeah. and its members, yeah. past and present. This is a wonderful place, filled overwhelmingly by people who are motivated by their notion of the national interest, by their perception of the public good, and by their duty, not as delegates, but as representatives to do what they believe is right for our country. We degrade this Parliament at our peril. I have served as a Member of Parliament for 22 years and for the last 10 as Speaker. This has been let me put it explicitly. The greatest privilege and honour of my professional life for which I will be eternally grateful. I wish my successor in the chair the very best fortune in standing up for the rights of honourable and right honourable members individually and for Parliament institutionally as the Speaker of the House of Commons. Thank you. very generous bunch of people indeed and thank you on both sides of the house for the expressions of support which I richly appreciate. I love this place, you love this place and we look forward to the future with interest, anticipation and enthusiasm. Uh, point of order, the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you Mr Speaker. I want to put on record my thanks to you as being a superb Speaker of this House. My thanks to you as a colleague in Parliament and my thanks to your family for the way in which they've supported you through often very difficult times when many of the media have been very unfair on you. And your two sons are getting good at football. I did some kicks with them in the Speaker's Court the other day. I was very impressed actually. They're coming on well. And I know you support the same club as me. But Mr Speaker, in your role as Speaker, you've totally changed the way in which the job has been done. You've reached out to people across the whole country. You've visited schools, you've visited factories, you've visited offices. You've talked to people about the role of Parliament and democracy. And I've never forgotten you coming to sit in Islington College in my constituency and spending the morning with me talking to a group of students, all of whom had learning difficulties, and we discussed with them the roles of democracy and Parliament. And you've taken absolutely on board the uh, words of Speaker Lenthal that you're there to be uh, guided and act on behalf of our Parliament. This Parliament is the stronger for your being Speaker. Our democracy, is the, our democracy is the stronger for your being the Speaker. And whatever you do when you finally step down from Parliament, you do so with the thanks of a very large number of people. And as one that has made the role of Speaker in the House 
more powerful, not less powerful. I welcome that. And as somebody who aspires to hold executive office, I like the idea of a powerful parliament holding the executive to account. It's something I've spent the last 35 years doing myself. <laughs> so, Mr Speaker, enjoy the last short period in your office, but it's going to be one of the most dramatic there has been. And I think your choice of timing and date is um, incomparable and will be recorded in the history books of parliamentary democracy. Mr Speaker, on behalf of the Labour Party, I thank you for your work in promoting democracy and this House. Thank you. Thank you. I just say to the Right Honourable General, the Leader of the Opposition, he's very much more experienced and senior than I, but I think that as backbenchers in our respective parties, we did have quite a lot in common, certainly speaking for myself as a backbencher and frequently as an opposition frontbencher, I found that I had a relationship with my whips characterised by trust and understanding. I didn't trust them and they didn't understand me. <laughs> and point of order, the Minister for the Cabinet Office and the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, Mr Michael Gove. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, uh, I would like to, uh, perhaps for the first time, associate myself wholeheartedly with the comments of the Leader of the Opposition. Um, since, you, since you entered the House of Commons in 1997, it has been clear to everyone who has seen you work as a diligent constituency MP, as an effective backbencher and also as a tenacious frontbencher in your time, that you love this House of Commons, you love our democracy and your commitment to your principles and to your constituents is unwavering and an example to others. It is the case that this evening I shall vote with many of my colleagues for an early general election. I hope you won't take that personally, Mr <laughs> Speaker, because I have no wish to prematurely truncate your time in the chair. Because it is the case, however controversial the role of a backstop may be in other areas, your role as the backbencher's backstop has certainly been one that's been appreciated by individuals across this House. Um, I spent much, though not all, of the last ten years as a member of the executive, but I have also been a backbencher in this House, and I have personally appreciated the way in which you have always sought to ensure that the executive answers for its actions. And I think that history will record the way in which you have used the urgent question procedure and other procedures to hold the executive to account, have restored life and vigour to Parliament, and in so doing, you have been in the very best tradition of speakers. Now, it is the case, as a member of the executive, that from time to time, uh, those of us on this side of the House might have bridled or chastened uh, some of the uh, judgments that you've made. But I have never been in any doubt, Mr Speaker, that you have operated on the basis that the executive must be answerable to this House in the same way as this House is answerable to the people. You have done everything in your power in order to ensure not just the continued but the underlined relevance of this place. Your love of democracy is transparent in everything that you say and do. And in such, I want to, on behalf of myself as an individual and on behalf of the Conservative Party, to say thank you and as a fellow parent of pupils at a distinguished <laughs> at a distinguished West London comprehensive can i also say can i also say how important it is that discipline is maintained in this house and your energetic efforts to do so are appreciated even by those of us who may not always be the best behaved in class well i thank the right honourable gentleman that was characteristically generous and gracious of him at the risk of inflicting some damage upon his otherwise flourishing political career, I have on more than one occasion paid public tribute to the quality of the Right Honourable Gentleman. One of the reasons why he doesn't complain about urgent questions being granted, to which he has at short notice to answer, is that the fact is that the Right Honourable Gentleman is quick enough, bright enough, sharp enough, fair-minded enough, articulate enough and dexter enough to be able to cope with whatever is thrown at him. I don't want this to become a mutual admiration society because I'm not sure whether it will be more damaging to him or to me, but I thank him for what he said, for the way in which he said it, and for the spirit that his remarks embody. Uh, yes, of course. Point of order, Mr Hilary Benn. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. I, I wouldn't for a minute... Would you... I'm saving him up. Oh, you're saving him up. Right. Thank you very much, <laughs> Mr. Speaker. I wouldn't seek for a minute to challenge your decision, not least because you'd rule me out of order, but I have to say that I regret it and respect it. And I say that for this reason, that when the history books come to be written, 
you will be described as one of the great reforming speakers yep. of the House of Commons. And the reason is because you have indeed been the backbencher's friend and supporter. But in every decision you have made, you have put one consideration above everything else. Your wish to enable the House of Commons to discuss matters and to express a view. Yeah, yeah. And there have been occasions when some in the House have taken umbrage at decisions that you have reached, but you have stood by your beliefs and your principles, and there are many, many members of this House who are eternally grateful to you for having stood up for our rights <laughs> to enable us to debate and then to vote on something. The fact that the Speaker decides that something should be debated is not that the Speaker is saying the House should agree it, it is the Speaker saying that we should be able to cast our vote. And that is why we will regard you in that light for many, many years to come. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. A point of order, my next door neighbour and very loyal next door neighbour and very brilliant next door neighbour in constituency terms of over 20 years, Mr David Liddington. Mr, Mr. Mr. Speaker, could I as an elector in the Buckingham constituency, not least, um, offer an expression of thanks to you for your work as a constituency member of Parliament yeah, yeah. over the last 22 years. Talking to neighbours and acquaintances in all parts of the Buckingham constituency over the years which you have represented it, I have been struck by the fact that men and women of very different political persuasions and indeed those of no particular party affiliation are united in their appreciation of the fact that you have never allowed your considerable duties as Speaker of the House detract from your responsibility to represent their interests in Buckingham and to respond to the concerns which they raise with you. And while uh, colleagues in all parts of the House will speak about your uh, record as Speaker, those of us in Buckinghamshire will know how you have continued to speak on and champion local interests and local, uh, local uh, uh, issues. I know too that you will be missed amongst the somewhat eclectic team of honourable and right honourable members representing the county of Buckinghamshire. It is perhaps a good measure of the fact that uh, in this place, despite frequent clashes and disagreements, we can still manage to get on, that those Buckinghamshire parliamentary meetings bring together not just you and I, but my right honourable friend, the member for Cheshire and Amersham, and both my right honourable friend, the member for Beaconsfield, and my honourable friend, the member for Wickham, uh, in a <laughs> spirit of <laughs> harmony, at least on county matters. <laughs> so, uh, so I thank you for what you have done for us locally, and also, if I may, uh, Mr Speaker, as a former Leader of the House, for what you have done to uh, communicate more to people, and particularly to school children and students around the country, about how this place works and the constitutional significance of Parliament in defending the liberties and debating the interests of the next generation. Well, I thank the Right Honourable Gentleman for what he said, and I just want to observe, and I think that others will bear testimony to this in the light of what he's just said, that the Right Honourable Gentleman was frankly an outstanding leader of the House of Commons. Yeah. He is one of the most cooperative and collaborative colleagues whom one could hope to meet. He gets things done, he's extremely personable, and I think it's fair to say that he works on the basis of periodic political difference but continuing personal amiability. If others of us were able to model ourselves on the way in which he's gone about his work over the last 27 years as a Member of Parliament, 
we would probably be doing better. I thank him for what he said. We must proceed before too long, but I do apologise very sincerely to the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Leader of the Third Party in this House, for failing to see him at an earlier point, which I should have done. Point of order, Mr Ian Blackford. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I say on behalf of those of us in these branches that we will be sad to see you leaving of the office at the end of October? I think it's fair to say that you have shown considerable grace and courtesy, not just to us, but to members across this House, and we are eternally grateful for the way that you have conducted yourself, particularly over these last few months, at a time of, let's be honest, of constitutional crisis for all of us, and the way that you have facilitated back ventures in particular, <coughs> been able to hold the executive into account, and indeed be able to make sure that those of us that are sent to this place are able to do our job to best endeavours representing their interests. Like the Leader of the Opposition, I think we can say that we are grateful that you will be with us until the end of October, yeah, yeah. and we yeah, yeah. look forward to the guidance and supervision that you give to our affairs over the course of the coming weeks. You have been a great friend to many of us in this House. We wish you every good wish to you and your family for the coming period. You will always get a friendly welcome in Scotland, and indeed we would love to see you up in Ross Sky and Look Avon. Mr Speaker, thank you very much on behalf of all of us. Thank you. Point of order, Dan Cheryl Gillan. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, as you know, uh, at the beginning of this parliamentary term, uh, you asked me if I would propose you uh, for the chair, and I was very pleased uh, to do so. Um, I think I made the immortal uh, statement that uh, I think you annoy members on all front benches from time to time, which is probably a testament to your even-handedness. <laughs> and I think there was, not a, uh, there was not a dry eye in the House, uh, because that was true. However, I have to add my voice to that of my, my colleague in Buckinghamshire, for the simple reason that as a colleague in Buckinghamshire, you have been absolutely superb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, Speaking as the only female representative of a constituency in Buckinghamshire, I sometimes find it necessary to keep some of you boys under control uh, because uh, you don't always quite see eye to eye with me. I just want to rise to my, rise to my feet um, to say a big thank you to you for something else that you've done in your time as Speaker. You've hosted events for more than a thousand charities in Speaker's House over the time. And you have been a true champion uh, of people with autism. And today, as the All Party Parliamentary Group publishes the report of 10 years since the Autism Act, I want to pay tribute to everything that you have done, particularly for charitable works, but also for people and families with autism. Yeah. I have one great regret, knowing that you are going to be standing down, that I will lose a great champion in my fight against HS2. <laughs> uh, and I very much hope that uh, when you go into retirement from this house, whatever you do, you will continue to join me in the fight against HS2 and continue, most importantly, to champion those people with autism and their families. Thank you very much. You know, I thank the Right Honourable Lady for what she said, but also for all the good fellowship that she and I have enjoyed over the last 22 years that I've been in this house with her. Uh, yes, a, point, uh, a matter of seniority, really, as well as a magnificent tie. A point of order, Mr. Barry Sherman. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I remember when I first met you, I went home to my wife and I said, I've met this really bumptious, self opinionated, right wing, <laughs> objectionable character. <laughs> and uh, I could say that you haven't changed, but the fact of the, f fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, you have been an exemplary speaker, yeah. Yeah. you've been Parliament Speaker. I have been here quite a long time, so I've seen people uh, organising the Speaker's election, usually the whips. You broke that tradition, we broke that tradition, cross party, we wanted you, we denied the whips who they wanted, and we got you. And I certainly, and those of us who have been around this place for some time, don't regret for a moment that we got. Parliament Speaker, and you really have proved that we were right in our choice. Can I just say one thing? You have been magnificent in the way you've got around. 
I remember the day you said we planned it well in advance, but we chose the day that when you'd come to the whole day in Huddersfield. Unfortunately, it was the day after the referendum, <laughs> and uh, it was a quite an interesting atmosphere. But I do remember you coming, getting to Huddersfield, and saying, "This is an awfully long way, isn't it, Barry?" <laughs> uh, but you did get about. You did see how constituents work. You did come to the Huddersfield University. You actually did the job well. And I also have to say, you also, as a speaker, have been the champion of the backbencher. These people here on the whips, on the front benches, love it to have the, their own way. You were determined to let people like myself, a backbencher, and other backbenchers to have their say. And you've renewed. There's been a renaissance of Parliament under your speakership. I only hope we get someone half as good as you when we actually single-mindedly, happily, diversely, uh, democratically choose your successor. Thank you for everything you've done for parliamentary democracy. Bless you, Barry, for what you've said. Uh, of course I will come. I, will the Honourable Gentleman forgive me? Mr Dominic Grieve. Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, as another Buckinghamshire MP, I couldn't fail to rise um, to say words to you of thanks for what you've done. You may recall, and it's perhaps worth recalling, that when you were first elected Speaker, I think I was the only person in the chamber who didn't stand to applaud you. And I have to say that was for two reasons. One was because I rather disapprove of these displays. And secondly, because I have to say that my preferences lay elsewhere. Uh, but I think I also Abby indicated Chelsea. to you uh, subsequently <laughs> that I would do my very Abby best Chelsea. to support you. And I have to say that as the years have gone by, I have come to appreciate that in the extraordinary times in which we live, your leadership of this House has been, in my judgment, exemplary in terms of the way in which you have stood up for the rights of backbenchers. It will undoubtedly go down as such, and I think it will set a benchmark which in future, built on by future speakers, will enable this House to operate very much better. And as for Buckinghamshire, Mr Speaker, you will undoubtedly be missed. I sometimes think in the troubled times in which we live, it's time to return to those 17th century practices of setting up county associations and deciding to keep the rest of the world out, because we would then find that we agree with each other 100 per cent. I thank the run on the gentleman for what he said. I regard him as a quite exceptional parliamentarian, so to receive a tribute from him means a great deal to me, and I think he knows that. Yes, a point of order, Angela Eagle. Um, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I'm one of those that did originally support you when you stood in quite troubled times and unexpectedly as the Speaker, and I did so uh, because you had already demonstrated uh, to uh, me and others that you were open-minded enough to have gone on a journey. And people have not expressed this particular part of you yet in these, in these points of order, but your commitment to equality for women, LGBT people and the disabled to ensure that there's proper inclusion for everyone in our country, in our politics, is the thing I think perhaps that has most impressed me. Now, we've worked together behind the scenes because I was shadow leader of the House, and I know how committed, in very difficult times, wrestling with rather a conservative and hidebound institution uh, that you have been. And I think that for that reason alone, for your determination, for your judgment, for your confidence in your judgment, for your deep understanding of the way that our Parliament works, for your willingness to stand up for the rights of backbenchers against some of the most ferocious behaviour by government, you will be remembered as one of the great reforming speakers. And I hope that as you get your evenings back, and as you be able to make a choice about which chair you sit in and for how long. <laughs> and go to the toilet. <laughs>
<laughs> well, Mr. Speaker, I wasn't going to mention your bladder. <laughs> it's a good bladder. And I'm still not. But I hope that as you look back and reflect on all of these tumultuous times, you will look back with satisfaction on the role you have played, because you deserve to. You have been an outstanding speaker, and I wish to add my thanks to some of the spontaneous tributes that we are hearing now. Thank you. Well, I thank the Right Honourable Lady. Put simply, I have been very lucky. And I think if you do for a living something which causes you to jump out of bed in the morning looking forward to the day ahead, then frankly, you're blessed. Uh, point of order, Mr. Peter Bone. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, you have been an extraordinary speaker and uh, an outstanding speaker. Over the last few weeks, I've disregarded, I very much disagree with your interpretation of certain standing orders. But for 14 years, you have transformed this place while I have been here. You used to sit behind me on the benches over there, heckling like mad the government. And then I hear the nerve, sir, of you telling us off for heckling. <laughs> but I hope when we forget the Brexit period, you will be remembered for completely transforming this place and allowing backbenchers to do their job and for new members who come here, an opportunity to fulfil a career as a backbencher are not necessary want to be a minister. Yeah. The Honourable Gentleman speaks from personal experience as a parliamentarian who is always ready to speak truth to power. I identify with him and what he said, not least in light of some of his recent disagreements with me, is big of him. Point to order, Lucy Powell. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I want to associate myself with everything that has been said so far, perhaps uh, except the HS2 remarks. Um, <laughs> could, I, uh, could I just add a couple of other, of other points that haven't been mentioned? The first is that without your uh, family-friendly reforms to this place, particularly yeah, yeah. with the nursery opening, your willingness to introduce proxy voting, allowing babies yeah. and young yeah. children yeah. to go into the lobbies. Yeah. Without yeah. Of those reforms, I and many others in this place, mothers and fathers alike, would not have been able to carry out our duties and to carry on being members of Parliament. So I want to thank you enormously for those uh, changes and reforms. The other thing I just want to say, Mr Speaker, I think in your time as Speaker, probably the most difficult event of that period uh, was the murder of our friend Joe Cox. And I think the way in which you uh, gave leadership to this whole place and to our collective grief, to the grief of her community and her family visiting uh, her constituency the day after her terrible murder. I know her family would want me to thank you from the bottom of their heart for your uh, leadership at that very, very difficult time for this House. Thank you. As everybody here knows, Jo was very special and she'll remain in our hearts for as long as we live. Point of order, Steve Baker. Mr Speaker, as a Buckinghamshire colleague, it has been a huge pleasure and privilege to work alongside you to further the interests of our constituents. I do say our constituents because I fondly remember occasions on which I have needed to speak on, in this place on your behalf, and it has been my privilege and pleasure to do that. And it would be graceless of me, of course, to refer to anything where I might possibly have disagreed with you, but I will just say, <laughs> I will just say it's perfectly plain to me that you love this place and this Parliament, and I'm grateful for all of your service. Well, I thank the Honourable Gentleman. He's a conviction politician, and that deserves respect. Uh, point of order, Joe Swinson. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. And I would like to express thanks from the Liberal Democrat benches for your decade of service in the chair. I think that very often to those outside, Parliament can appear stuffy and out of touch. And some of the initiatives that have come in on your watch, the right reforms with topical questions and indeed your own willingness to grant urgent questions has meant that when people are talking about issues outside of this place, we can be discussing them in a timely way in this House and that has been important. I was very moved by your tribute to your wife and children because 
I think all of us in this place who uh, have our families put up with a lot uh, for us to do the jobs that we do. And uh, I would echo the comments of uh, the Honourable Member for Manchester Central about the reforms that you have made possible through the parliamentary nursery, babies being in, in able to be in uh, voting lobbies, and indeed your uh, forbearance in not asking me to leave when I brought baby Gabriel into this House, and indeed uh, the proxy voting reforms, which have already made such a difference for members with small babies during these rather uh, intense few months of parliamentary debate. Those reforms have been truly important and you have been a truly modernising speaker. There is, of course, and I'm sure you would agree, much more to do and I hope that whoever is your successor will continue in that tradition. And the final thing I would say, Mr Speaker, is you have been an absolutely unstinting guardian of parliamentary democracy at a time when people feel the need to take to the streets to argue to defend our democracy. I think back to my first term in this place between 2005 and 2010. I'm not convinced, if you'd asked me at the time, for me to pinpoint the most important vote that I cast in that five years, that I would have chosen that vote in 2009. But I think that in choosing you to be Speaker of this House, arguably that was the most important vote cast for the future of our country and our parliamentary democracy. And I'm very glad that I and the others in this House made that choice. Thank you. Uh, point of order, Sir Edward Lee. Um, so far, we've mainly heard from distinguished members of the two front benches or immediately prior members. But just on behalf of the permanent or semi permanent backbenchers, <laughs> who either by their own wish or because nobody in my case has ever asked me <laughs> have not in recent years joined the front bench. May I just say that although personally I haven't followed you in your political journey, Mr Speaker, <laughs> and I have to say on many occasions you've absolutely infuriated me, I have to say one thing that was one thing that on behalf of backbenchers nobody can ever take away from you and that is that you have been determined to give a voice to those people in this place who want to ask real questions of the executive and for this we will always be grateful thank you well i'm grateful to the honorable gentleman he was of course a talented minister but i've always thought because i know that his career came to a premature end that he suffered from the notable disadvantage as a member of the government of not only holding opinions but feeling inclined with notable frequency, whether wanted or not, to express them. <laughs> and that seemed to me why he was removed from the government. But I think the executive's loss was Parliament's gain. Point of order, Mr Jim Shannon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I also add uh, our, our party's uh, thanks to you, Mr Speaker. Uh, you have always been the backbench champion. Uh, you've called me in this house as often as you've called the Honourable Member for Huddersfield. I have to say, Mr Speaker, that you often perhaps gently chastise me in the word of the word you. Can I say you, Mr Speaker, have done excellent for the backbenchers in this House, and I am trying very hard not to use that word on other occasions. I know you have brought me to, to, to count a few times, and you have gently, with your humour, with your kindness, with your goodwill, have enabled me to, to learn the protocol of this House in a way that hopefully will be, be here for, uh, for time to come. You also, Mr Speaker, in my speeches in this House, even with the Ulster Scots and my accent, you always seem to understand what we were doing. The one thing uh, uh, that's very important, and you mentioned it today, and I, I'm going to say it as well, you mentioned about Sally and about your children. And the, and the most important thing for us all in this House is the sanity we have when we go back to our families. Uh, and, and they are incredibly important. Um, one, one closing point, uh, Mr. <laughs> Speaker, to say to you as well. As you know, I turn up to the adjournment debates every night, and you're always here as well. If you're not here, Mr. Speaker, I will miss you. And hopefully, <laughs> hopefully on, 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 in the future, Mr. Speaker, you, you, whatever you do in this world, I know you'll do it well. And I wish you well. I wish your family well. Uh, and Godspeed and God bless. Uh, colleagues, I hope you'll forgive me if I just say this very publicly to the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Strangford. I bet others have noticed it, I certainly have, ever since he came into the House and we got to know each other. The Honourable Gentleman 
is a person of strong religious faith. As it happens, I'm not. I've always been proud of my Jewish roots and my Jewish identity, but I am not a practicing religious person. What I admire about the Honourable Gentleman, and I think makes him a most lovable figure in the House of Commons, is that he radiates warmth, empathy and compassion. And he is one of those people of faith who doesn't spend time preaching it, he lives it. Oh, oh, indeed. Point of order, Sir John Hay. Mr. Mrs. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, such, such, such is the length of our relationship and the friendship about which I think we can now come clean. It's long been suspected uh, that I rushed here from Lincolnshire uh, when I heard the news of your imminent <laughs> departure. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in an age of technocratic turgidity and mechanistic uh, mediocrity, you have brought colour and style to this place. No one could deny your eloquence, nor your extraordinary encyclopedic grasp of facts, of which we are all jealous, frankly. I mean, how you manage to remember not only uh, facts about our constituencies, but our birthdays, our wedding anniversaries, our children's names. What don't you remember, Mr. Speaker? And you have given life to this place in a way that few could ever have managed and few of your predecessors uh, have achieved. You've made this place, uh, if I might say so, far more interesting than it would have been without you. But there's something else, Mr. Speaker, that's rarely said about you, and it is this. I fully recognise your sensitivity and your humanity. There are countless acts of kindness which you've shown members of this House, never publicised because they wouldn't be by their nature, uh, which I think it's only fair now to draw attention to. Where members have had difficulties of one sort or another, um, the trials and tribulations, the inevitable consequence of life here, you've always been there for them. And that work, that work as our speaker, uh, needs to be recorded and celebrated as well as acknowledged today. So uh, not a, I will not only miss you, Mr Speaker, for your indulgence, of which I have been a frequent beneficiary, as you well know, but also for your character and style. And that will last long after we leave this chair, as I hope our friendship will too. Our friendship will endure for a long time to come, I say to the right honourable gentleman. Amongst other things we have in common, we share a passion for and a slightly obsessive preoccupation with historical statistics relating to tennis. By the way, I've never lost any sleep over a work-related matter because it's not worth doing. The nights without sleep that I've tended to experience over the years, and doubtless will do so in the future, have ordinarily been during either the US Open or the Australian Open, when my normal practice, as the Right Honourable Gentleman knows, is to forgo sleep if the alternative is the opportunity to watch my all-time sporting hero, Roger Federer. <laughs> a point of order, Anna Subri. Much, very much, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, you and I first came across each other well over 40 years ago when we were both <coughs> members of the Conservative Party as students. And I couldn't possibly repeat the language of the Honourable Member for Huddersfield, but I do endorse the right wing bit. Uh, and I, of course, was what was known then as a, a proud wet uh, and certainly on the pink liberal wing of the Conservative Party. And though our, our journey has been somewhat and our route different, I rather suspect that we are back together in our new place. Uh, and that's going to be interesting in all that follows. But I remember that when you were a student, you had a huge passion for politics, for Parliament, and of course you were hugely eloquent 
even then. And all of those things served you well for many years, but most importantly, they have served this place hugely well as a member of this place, but also in your role <coughs> as Speaker. I won't repeat, just endorse all the fine tributes about the great reforms that you've made to this place, especially on behalf of women and also on behalf of all the young people in my constituency and the children who have come to this place in a way that certainly previous generations didn't, have learned so much and felt engaged. And finally, I'd like to apologise on behalf of a small group of us who, by virtue of our appalling behaviour, Mr Speaker, found ourselves as founder members of the three Bs. And when I come back, which I think I will at some stage, yes, that's right, before, if we have any such general election, I'll bring you the little badge that I have with the three Bs, which stand for bollocked by Burko. <laughs> I'm very proud of the membership of that club, but on behalf of my merry band, and indeed all of us, thank you for everything you've done and the great service you've given to this place. Bless you, and thank you. We are running out of time, and we've got to October, says the Honourable Gentleman from Hove, from a sedentary position, but first of all, we must hear from Mr David Lammy. Well, Mr Speaker, much has been said, obviously, by members of Parliament in this place, but I just want to put on record, I suspect, a deep thanks in huge parts of this country and to absolutely echo what has been particularly said by the member for Wallasey. Uh, I was in this House after the riots of 2011, and I thank you for um, helping to recall the House to debate that very, very important subject. And most recently, uh, after a scandal that involved people from Caribbean backgrounds, thank you for granting my urgent question that led to the revelation of that scandal. There are so many issues that have concerned minorities in this country who could so easily, as has been the case in previous decades in our country, remained on the fringes. Thank you for putting them at the centre of the action in this Parliament. Uh, and thank you also for appointing Rose Hudson Wilkin as the chaplain yeah. when, the, when the establishment might have preferred a different choice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, Mr Speaker, yes, the role of Speaker is being part of the establishment. It takes a giant, and of course you aren't a giant, <laughs> to stand up to that establishment and never be cowed. The next speaker has very, very big shoes to fill. Well, that's extraordinarily eloquent and generous, but I don't want to comment on anything the honourable gentleman, the right honourable gentleman, has said about me. But I want to endorse in triplicate what he's just said about the Right Reverend Rose Hudson Wilkin, yeah. chaplain to the Speaker of the House of Commons, great servant to Parliament, in her place, the undergallery now, the source of comfort and inspiration to me for the last nine years. There has not been a single day when I have not felt delighted and reinforced in my insistence, and it was my insistence, my insistence that Rose would be appointed to that role. Uh, there is always scope for legitimate difference of opinion, but there were people, part of what I have to say outside of this place, I will call the bigot faction, <laughs> who volunteered their views as to what an inapposite appointment I had made, with all the force and insistence at their disposal, which sadly from their point of view were in inverse proportion to their knowledge of the subject matter <laughs> under discussion. They hadn't met Rose, they didn't know her, they couldn't form a view. They had a stupid, dim-witted, atavistic, racid and rancid opposition 
to the Reverend Rose. I was right, they were wrong, the House loves her. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. A uh, point of order, point of order, Dawn Butler. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, and I want to just say a huge thank you for all that you've done for backbenchers and for democracy, especially throughout this time as we discuss um, Brexit. Um, I also want to thank you for all the first that you've done in the House. Um, Stonewall. A list of LGBT plus employers. Parliament has, has moved up to now 23rd. I think we were down in the 70s and the 80s before. Parliament has been ranked the best 100 employers at the Race Equality Awards. That's because of your guidance and leadership, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, thank you for appointing Reverend Rose. I think she's in the corner crying, actually, uh, with the rest of us. Um, so thank you so much. She has been amazing, as is you, Mr. Speaker. The first Muslim sergeant at arms, Mr. Speaker. The first, the first female clerk of the House, Mr. Speaker. All of the, t the fact that young people are allowed to debate in this chamber has come under you, Mr. Speaker. All of the charities that you have held um, in the Speaker's House, the BSL, Windrush, uh, uh, being able to raise the flag for International Women's Day outside Parliament for the first time, Mr. Speaker, Black History Month. I could go on to all that you've done to modernise this place, and I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, Mr. Speaker. And I'm I hope you can just bear with me because um, equality is a theme that you have championed, Mr. Speaker, and I just want to raise a point of order following last week's resignation. I'm deeply concerned that the position that I shadow uh, for Minister for Women and Equalities remains vacant. And with more than half of the current cabinet opposed to equal marriage, I'm concerned that this brief has been undermined deliberately to roll back the hard fought for rights and protections. And Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, being a bit of a girly swat myself, I have calculated that when the following person is appointed, they will be the tenth to be appointed to the brief since 2010. It has moved departments four times, and if we have a new minister, it will be the fifth minister that I would have shadowed in just two years. Mr Speaker, the, the government may groan on the other side. You don't even feel half the pain that we feel on this side of the House. Trump recently described Boris Johnson as Britain's Trump, which he was grinning like a Cheshire cat. And Mr Speaker, in the United States, we have seen what can happen when you, when you place a racist and a sexist in charge of the country, implementing a Muslim ban for people arriving and leaving this country, banning trans people from serving in the military, pushing to allow businesses to turn LGBT customers away way or making it easier for LGBT people to be sacked or telling the squad, a group of four elected congresswomen of Kuala, to go back to their countries. Our Prime Minister is modelling his campaign on his, on, the male, on his mate Trump and is proven by the fact that Number 10 recently carried out a so-called culture war on polling on trans people. It's a disgrace, Mr Speaker, to equalities and it's so obvious that the Tories don't care about this brief. Women have suffered 87% of the cuts and we have seen a 375% rise in hate crime. Mr Speaker, we cannot allow this kind of hateful and divisive politics to continue to infect the UK. If any government is in need of a minister to fight against racism, sexism and homophobia, it's this one. Mr Speaker, I wonder if you can just shed some light with your, with, with your commitment to equality. I just wonder if you can shed some light. If you know when the Prime Minister will stop passing this vital, important brief around, just like an inconvenience, and whether, whether the Prime Minister will start treating the Women in Equalities brief with the respect that it deserves and appoint a full-time Secretary of State to the brief and a department just like Labour has pledged to do. Well, let me just say to the Honourable Lady that she said what she thought and it's on the record and people can make their own assessment of it. Let me just say that I do regard the portfolio as a matter of the utmost importance. And one of the encouraging phenomena of recent years has been the emergence of an apparent consensus across the House as to the importance of this set of issues. That's precious. It should be cherished. 
It would be perilous if it were lost or put at risk. I very much hope, in the very difficult circumstances that we now face, that there will be a replacement minister soon. Not a matter for me, but I feel very confident that appointment will be made before very long. These issues have to be focused upon with a relentless tenacity. You cannot just take them for granted or think job done. And sadly, all too often, we observe people in very, very, very senior positions around the world who do not appear to be adequately conscious, if conscious at all, of the scale of their responsibilities. With power comes responsibility. And we don't want to hear, for example, and the government rightly criticised it, we don't want to hear and we utterly deprecate as a political tool the use of language such as go back. It's unacceptable and it shouldn't be ignored, it has to be called out and you need a focus for these issues and the existence of a minister is a part of that focus mirrored by the select committee which scrutinises the minister's work. We have an excellent women in equalities committee which it's to the great credit of the government that it established and it is important that it should have a minister to scrutinise. A point of order, Jess Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm almost, I mean, I'm thankful uh, to the member for Brent on our front bench, sort of slightly changing the tone because I have an actual point of order. Um, <laughs> but I, I wish to associate myself uh, with all of the comments. I have been called over the years to both criticise uh, you, Mr. Speaker, and also defend you. Had I known what I have found out today <laughs> about HS2, the latter would have been harder. Uh, I uh, have no idea that you were against HS2, which will obviously revolutionise the place where I live. Anyway, that's not my point of order. You, uh, Mr Speaker, I know, because of everything that has been said today, that you encourage people like me to stand up and say when we think things are wrong, and we think things can be improved about Parliament. And I, don't, I love Parliament just as you do, and I wish for it to be in its in its healthiest form so that people can once again trust us because there is a, a lack of trust in the country of this place at the moment. So I wonder if he could help me understand why in cases where members of this House may be, um, have found and proven to be found, regardless of whether they do it on parliamentary time or not, to have committed what I would call in certain cases, violence against women and girls, or in fact, if uh, a member of this House were to be in court for uh, crimes um, that are of violent or uh, abusive, um, what protections do we in this place put in place for the vulnerable people who will go and see them in their surgeries. Because yeah. when I worked in the voluntary sector, if I was a teacher, if I was a doctor, if I was a police officer, I would not be allowed to see the public during a period where there was an investigation going on into me with regards to vulnerable people and potential abuse of them. And I have deep concerns about the safeguarding of our country and how it looks that seemingly the laws around vulnerable people do not apply to this place. I take very seriously what the Honourable Lady has said. I think it bears solemn reflection. And rather than giving some ill-judged response on the hoof, I would prefer to discuss the matter privately with the Honourable Lady, which I make the genuine offer in the near future to do. We do a lot of things much better than we did, but as the leader of the Liberal Democrats pointed out, and I nodded vigorously as she made the observation, there's still a lot more to do. I like to view, I say this not least to those who are observing our proceedings, the cup is half full rather than half empty, but there's a fine line between being proud of what has been achieved and being satisfied. Being proud of what's been achieved is very often justified and we shouldn't rubbish ourselves 
Being satisfied is usually a very, very bad idea because it's the shortest possible route to complacency for which there is no justification. We need to do better. Let me just say to the Honourable Lady that I've come to know her over the last four years and I've learned a lot from the Honourable Lady. She is one of the most authentic politicians and best communicators one could hope to meet. And apart from anything else, and I hope I carry my colleagues with me in making this observation about the Honourable Lady. She has got guts and character to burn. Point of order. Um, point of order. Yes, oh, very well. The Honourable Lady was the loudest. You're the loudest, as well as having the biggest smile. A point of order. Sangham Debonair. Thank you, thank you, Mr Speaker. And I think so many things have been said about you that I hope you'll accept that I will make my tributes to you privately and I, 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 hope, I hope that we can continue to be friends. Even though I am a whip and you have said some rather interesting things about whips, <laughs> I actually wish to make a point of order, which is that the Leader of the House last week, when I asked him to apologise for comparing someone who is a whistleblower who felt that it was in the national interest for him to reveal details about the impact on possibly very ill people of the no deal Brexit, I'm so sorry for not giving you advance notice of this. I, he, and comparing him to a disgraced former doctor, a former doctor who made up evidence about the um, MMR immunisation, and he refused to do that. Now, that MMR, the MMR as a result of immunisations going down, herd immunity in this country for measles has gone down. That is a deadly disease. It is a deadly disease. And the Leader of the House has since apologised in public. But that's, of course, not on the record. So in making my point of order, I hope to put on record that he has apologised, but I really wish to seek your guidance on whether or not he can be asked to come to this House and put on record with equal measure his apology for what he said in this House about a very distinguished man to whom we should be grateful. Well, what I want to say to the Honourable Lady is that she's made her point with vigour and alacrity, and it's on the record, if she wants to obtain almost in real time an electronic copy of what she said and to deliver it to the Leader's office, she may well elicit a response. The Right Honourable Gentleman Member for North East Somerset, the Leader of the House, is somebody I've known for a very long time. I have sometimes agreed with him and sometimes not, but I have found that the Honourable Gentleman though he has delivered himself of some extremely waspish and widely objected to comments on this occasion, has invariably been widely regarded as courteous. He's a polite man and he's a gracious person. And I think he's, his characteristic and generosity of spirit could serve him well here. He's apologised outside the House. That was my understanding from the media, and it would be perfectly open to the Right Honourable Gentleman to do so in the Chamber. It's not for the Speaker to instruct him to do so. It is incumbent upon a member who has erred in this House to correct the record. Now, this is a matter of opinion rather than a fact, but if the Right Honourable Gentleman has apologised outside the House and can be cajoled, exhorted, charmed or persuaded by the Honourable Lady and me to beetle along to the Chamber to give us a sample of his contrition and humility, who knows, he may well be widely praised. In a point of order, Liz Savile Roberts. And it's, um, I am very well, saddened to stand on my feet on behalf of Plaid Cymru to make this address to you today. We are eternally grateful to you for the fact that you have made a point of ensuring that the, the various, the multifarious voices of this House are heard. There is such a, a variety. You mentioned earlier on the importance of Members of Parliament and their role. We need to remember in this place, I hope, that every Member of Parliament who is returned here is returned in exactly the same way by their constituents. Whichever party they stand and speak for, we are all here equally. I only hope that your successor will follow in your footsteps yeah, because it's yeah, meant yeah. much to us. Thank you. That was a very beautiful tribute, and I appreciate what the Honourable Lady has said. Point of order, Ian Paisley. 
Mr. Speaker, it would be remiss of me not to, uh, on behalf of all of the unionist members of this House, not to say a huge and hearty Ulster thank you to you, sir, for the work that you have done in this House, both as chairing of these proceedings and, of course, as your 22 years as, as Member of Parliament in this House. We, we do thank you. We thank you for your kindness outside of the Chamber as well as inside of the Chamber. You obviously have called one member from Northern Ireland more than anyone else in the whole House. He obviously catches your eye better than the rest of us. But we, we, we thank you. I know the member for Strangford has already uh, thanked you. But and they could also pass on to your staff a huge thank you because you've opened up the facilities of this House to members of Parliament for charitable groups, for uh, other personal activities that they're engaged in, that they bring them to you, and that your staff have been very, very obliging in assisting members of Parliament to ensure that issues that are important to them are properly advocated in this House. <coughs> your comments were very Burkean in that you said it is not for us just to give of our industry, but of our judgment. And each of us have different judgments on all sorts of matters. You, sir, have been able to respect those judgments, even though at times they would be very different from the views that you hold, or indeed very different from the views that we hold as members of this House. I know that members from nationalism in Northern Ireland who sat in this House would also like to be recorded publicly a thank you to you also. Even though nationalists no longer take their seats here, which is a shame, uh, those mem nationalist members who previously represented their constituents in this House, I know, would like to have a word of thank you to you also, sir, for the work that you have done as uh, chairman and speaker of these proceedings. On your many visits to Northern Ireland, I, I know that uh, you have a soft spot for Belfast and for the people there. You will be very welcome back on many an occasion. Uh, I'm sure that you will receive a rising reception in some places and a less rising reception in other places. But you will, sir, be welcome back in Belfast, many places. I know that the one thing that will probably disappoint you most is that you are not the speaker who will oversee the R and R of this building. I know that that is a personal passion of you, sir. But maybe as we enter into a new dispensation, free from Europe, we will have a fresh new Parliament to sit in. Thank you. I thank the honourable gentleman for what he said, but above all, I'm enormously appreciative of his remarks about the team in the Speaker's office to whom I referred. They have been steadfast, unwavering, efficient, and magnificent. All of them, and I've worked with many of them for several years in succession, a point of absolutely no interest to the bigger faction who formed their view and don't want any facts to get in the way. They won't write about it. They'll scribble their bigoted drivel because that's what they do. I mean, they'll tell their grandchildren, what, you know, what did you do for a living? Well, I wait, scribbled my bigoted drivel from some <laughs> down-market apology for a newspaper. Calling it a newspaper is probably a breach of the Trade Descriptions Act. But they won't mind. They're probably very proud of the sort of... You know, trashy articles by trashy journalists with trashy newspapers. I mean, it just goes with the turf. It's down market, it's substandard, it's low grade, there's no intellectual weight to it, but that's what they'll do. And it will always be about ad hominem attacks, because that's what makes their world go round. But the fact is that the people who work in my office have been outstanding. I know their worth. We know the strength of our relationship. And the person standing on my left who's worked with me, he's one of several who's worked with me for many, many years, has worked with me throughout the ten years I've been in post as Speaker. He was in the office for a decade before. He was educated at the University of Life. There isn't a pompous bone in his body. He wouldn't know the meaning of the word snobbery if it hit him over the head. But he is absolutely brilliant, and I'm grateful to him. Peter Barrett. And point of order, Dr. Sarah Wallerstern. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for being one of the great reforming speakers. Uh, it's you that is trying to take back control for this Parliament, and others should learn from your example. Um, you have also been a great champion of select committees, and I would like to thank you as Chair of the Liaison Committee for that. And also, you have been a champion of allowing 
backbenchers to hold the, par to hold the powerful to account. And that is my point of order now, further to the previous point of order. NHS staff are not only entitled to raise genuinely held concerns about patient safety, they have a duty to do so, and they must be able to do this without fear of intimidation or bullying from people in positions of power, including members of this House. Last week, the Leader of the House made highly offensive comments about Dr David Nicholl, and I would just reiterate that unless he comes to his place and makes an apology from the floor of the House. What message does that send to NHS whistleblowers and what does it mean for patient safety? Yeah. The Honourable Lady, for what she said, she is an extremely distinguished denizen of the House, both in respect of her constituency work and of her chairing of very important committees, chairing the Health Select Committee and chairing the Liaison Committee, and I think she speaks with very considerable authority and gravitas by virtue of those roles and the reputation that she's garnered. I don't want to pick an argument with the Leader of the House. He and I get on extremely well, but points have been made and the Honourable Lady has underlined them. If she's dissatisfied, my advice to her is the advice I regularly give to members wanting to know how they can take a matter forward, and the word begins with P and ends with T. Persist! 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 There's nothing to stop the Honourable Lady returning to the matter when we come back after the conference recess. On the Conservative benches, the Right Honourable Gentleman, the member for New Forest East, who's not in his place, I think he's chairing various committees this afternoon or attending committee meetings, taught me decades ago that in politics, quantity, persistence and above all repetition are at least as important as the quality of your argument. It's not good enough to have a good point and make it once. You have to keep going, or if I may say so, at the risk of causing some disquiet on grounds of courtesies, I would suggest to the Honourable Lady that she should follow the Churchill adage in pursuit of her cause. KBO, keep buggering on at all times. And point of order, I will come. Jonathan Ashworth, point of order. A grateful Mr Speaker, and I of course associate myself with all the remarks that we have heard about you stepping down. I shall embarrass you by throwing more compliments at you. Uh, can I reinforce the point that my humble friend from Bristol West has made and the Chair of the Select Committee? The Leader of the House last week was quite frankly disgraceful and irresponsible in his comments about Dr Nicholl. He should come to this chamber and apologise from the dispatch box. That would be the courteous thing to do. But more importantly, Mr Speaker, do you agree that if the government are confident that they have a system to ensure our, our constituents and patients will get timely access to medicines, then they should publish the analysis now so we can scrutinise that analysis in this House of Commons in the time that we have left. Being that we will return to both issues ere long if the legendary indefatigability of the honourable gentleman doesn't desert him in the weeks and months ahead, it won't, and therefore we'll hear more on those subjects. We come now to a point of order, Tulip Sidney. Most members of this House have served under you for a lot longer than I have, but I thought it would be remiss of me not to thank you for supporting me at a time when my life was in danger. I'm not going to go into too many details, but I wanted to say thank you because you provided a lot of protection for me at a very dark hour of my life. And I want to say thank you, but I also want to say thank you when we're talking about life and death because you supported my constituent, Nazneen Zaghari yes. Ratcliffe, yes. 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 by giving her case a lot of priority in this House, granting urgent questions, bringing debates forward, but most importantly, you went to see Richard Ratcliffe when he was on a hunger strike yes. outside the Iranian embassy, and I would say you also saved his life at the time. So throughout your career, you've looked after Parliament, you look, looked after democracy, but you, along, the la along the way, you've also saved lots of lives that people may not know about. I appreciate what the Honourable Lady said. Let me just say to her, I've not met Richard Ratcliffe before, visiting him and spending a little time with him were an honour. 
They were an honour. Anyone who's met Richard Ratcliffe knows that it's an honour. He's a quite remarkable human being. The sooner Nazanin is freed and can be reunited with her daughter and her husband and wider family, so much the better. It is intolerable beyond words that she has been denied her freedom by an act of dictatorial barbarity. And we will go on and on and on and on and on about this issue for as long as it takes for humanity to prevail over barbarism. And it would be good if this message were repeated much more widely, not just in this place by conscientious politicians, but in parts of the media that frankly are not really terribly interested. It's about time if they've got any sort of moral compass that they took an interest. In point of order, Rashnara Ali. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank you for all you've done in giving us the opportunity not only to hold our own government to account, but other governments in respect to human rights violations and for standing up for democracy. And I want to pick one example in particular where you agreed to host at the request of the leader of the then leader of the House and the mother of the House to host the Women in the World uh, members parliamentarians conference in this house with incredibly moving contributions from for women who risked their lives who lost family members in order to stand um, in stand up as parliamentarians in their respective countries the power of our this house to do good not only in this country but around the world remains undimmed despite and notwithstanding our current difficulties. And it's important that we remember that this House, at its best, is a source of inspiration around the world. And that is in no small part thanks to all you have done. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We will miss you and we wish you every, uh, we wish you uh, the warmest of regards for the future. Thank you. Well, I think the Right Honourable and Learned Lady, the Member for Camberwell and Peckham, has done huge and invaluable work on this front. She knows the issues, she feels them. She is, of course, as the Honourable Lady knows, a stellar progressive change maker. <laughs> And she's charted that course since she entered the House on the 28th of October 1982. She came into the House as a very, very, very young woman indeed. And she'll mark 37 years in the House next month. And if I know the Right Honourable Lady, in whatever capacity, she will keep pursuing these issues because they reflect her humanity and her attachment to principle and the rights of the underdog and the cause of equality. She, the Right Honourable Nelly Lady, like the Honourable Lady, came into politics for all the right reasons. Uh, well, I know the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Honourable Gentleman will be very proud of, of what I've just said about his wife. <laughs> and, and, we'll, and, he, and he's looking even happier than he otherwise would. We'll come, I'll come to the Honourable Gentleman, but it would be a pity to squander him at too early a stage of our proceedings when we've only been going for an hour and a quarter or so. So I'll come to the Honourable Gentleman momentarily. Point of order, Caroline Lucas. Thank you very much, yeah, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, and thank you for breaking one of your own rules, or maybe not a, a written rule, but I've only just come into the chamber, as you noticed. I wanted to, I wanted to apologise to explain I was off the parliamentary estate. I hadn't known the statement, obviously, that you were about to make, but as soon as I heard, I came back as fast as I could, because I wanted to thank you very seriously for your incredibly strong sense of fairness. As an MP uh, from a party of just one in this place, it is very easy to feel somewhat marginalised from time to time. And I take from you so much um, gratitude that you have always included the Green Party, recognising that I may only be one MP in here, but represent a party out there. So thank you for your incredibly strong sense of fairness and justice. Thank you for your reforming zeal in this place. We still have a long way to go, but thanks to you, we are a long way down that path. Yeah. The Honourable Lady may recall that she once asked me if it was all right if she included on the dust jacket of a book she was about to publish a tribute that I had paid her. 
And I said to the Honourable Lady I was more than delighted for her to use that tribute on the dust jacket. Uh, my rationale was very simple. I'd said what I'd said in public. I said it because I meant it, and I meant it so I said it. And having meant it and said it, I was more than happy for it to be reproduced. And I rather trust that it will continue to be at the Honourable Lady's pleasure. She is a superb parliamentarian, and I think that's recognised across the House. With about, without a vast infrastructure to support her, she is indefatigable, irrepressible and astonishing in her productivity and the sheer range of her political interests. She's a fine parliamentarian. Also, because she is the only member of her party at the moment in this House, she's in the very happy position of being leader and chief whip of her own party and I think of invariably agreeing with herself. <laughs> Finally, and I thank colleagues, and I, I know we've taken a long time, but we have got time, and frankly we'd have more time if we weren't disappearing for a rather excessive period. The point of order, Jack Dromey. Uh, Mr Speaker, can I echo the tributes that have been paid to you? You're one of history's finest speakers with a lasting yeah, yeah. legacy. And dare I say, in addition to everything else that's been said, one plain, decent man of immense integrity. I rise on another matter. The truly right honourable member for Meriden is leaving this House not because she has suffered shameful harassment and intimidation, including threats against her personal safety and the safety of her staff. Yet, Mr Speaker, there would seem to be in this House those who are oblivious to the consequences of their actions, yes. using language that scars the public discourse. Absolutely. Toxic talk of traitors, collaborators, conspirators, Absolutely. surrender. Mm -hmm. Language well that said. demeans democracy, Absolutely. fans the flames of hate and hate crime, puts the public at risk, and members of this House, women in particular, who are suffering often shameful treatment. Well said, Mr Speaker, is it in order in our great Parliament for language ever to be used, hateful language that can then have tragic consequences, as recent history has told us? Here, here, here. Well said. There is a fine balance that has to be observed. Free speech is important, and one doesn't want to suppress the right of members to hold and express with considerable force and sometimes ill judgment opinions very sincerely believed. But each and every one of us has in this place to weigh his or her words and to understand that we are in leadership positions and words count, words matter, words make a difference and words can cause great personal hurt and also be the trigger for actions by others. I have become increasingly conscious in recent times from members on both sides of the House of the escalation in hostile communications to members and sometimes to their families. And I want just to underline that we have to call out unacceptable behaviour, including the issue of language which can induce threats or constitutes a threat in its own right. And we have to recognise also that there are some people who are so deprived of a moral compass that they think that because they believe a particular thing strongly about a member that somehow justifies them subjecting that member and his or her family to vituperation, abuse, intimidation or worse. It does not, it cannot, it will not. And I remember 
being shocked when the honourable gentleman, the right honourable gentleman, the member for North East Somerset, was faced by aggressive demonstrations outside his home with people saying a lot of people disapprove of your dad. And that could have been deeply frightening to family members and young children. There have been other members on both sides of the House who have highlighted their experiences or the experiences of their family or of their constituency or parliamentary staff. And up with this, we cannot put, we simply have to say, as a matter of principle, it's wrong. And if we need to do more and better, including the investment of greater resources and an improved mindset within the police service and the House authorities, we will do that. I hope the Honourable Gentleman will forgive me if I say I've done my best, but not enough, not enough. And more will need to be done in the period ahead. Some of the responsibility for leadership on that front will lie with the next speaker. And it would be a good thing also if those who constantly prate about their right to free speech, to publish or be damned, to say exactly what they think, would ask themselves, is what we're about to produce likely to spark intimidation, harassment or violence, putting up pictures as though people are somehow public enemies of parliamentarians on front pages because they have dared to hold and express a view which differs from that of the newspaper concerned. Start to realise just how desperately dangerous that is and exercise a modicum of responsibility. Those people have got to learn to operate at the level of events. Thank you, colleagues.